Well, I'm so glad, as you know, uh, we have a great, great stable uh, crop, just selection of preachers that have just come to the way and have become a part of our preaching team. And uh, I, I always get joy to be able to uh, hear and listen to what God has placed within them. And today we get to hear one more time uh, from the great minister, LaVon Fakou. She is uh, the CEO. I just asked her if she was the CEO. So I'm everything, Pastor Mike. I was like, touch your name, just like that. Black woman magic, I'm everything, amen. She is the founder, the CEO, CFO, executive director of uh, a wonderful organization called Beautiful Scars, um, but is also just an awesome woman of God who is coming into her own with her own voice and ministry to help heal uh, the church and many of those who are in the church who are uh, outlasting and surviving uh, the abuse that is often uh, unleashed uh, sometimes on purpose and sometimes on accident to many of us. And so I'm so thankful for her ministry. And so come on, everybody, stand to your feet. Let's put our hands together for the great minister, LeVon. Thank you, Pastor Mike. to the scripture, uh, Zephaniah 3, 14 through 20. Brother ben Brandon's in the building today. Yeah. Amen, corner all the way back there. Yeah. <laughs> Zephaniah 3, 14 and 20. I'll be coming from the New Living Translation. And it starts, Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord will remove God's hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord God's self, the King of Israel, will live among you. At last, your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster. On that day, the announcement to Jerusalem will be, cheer up, Zion, don't be afraid. For the Lord your God is living among you. God is a mighty Savior. God will take delight in you with gladness. With God's love, God will calm all your fears. God will rejoice over you with joyful songs. I, this is God talking now, I will gather you who mourn for the appointed festivals. You will be disgraced no more. And I will deal severely with all who have oppressed you. I will save the weak and helpless ones. I will bring together those who were chased away. I will give glory and fame to my former exiles, wherever they have been mocked and shamed. On that day, I will gather you together and bring you home again. I, God, will give you a good name, a name of distinction among all the nations of the earth as I restore your fortunes before their very eyes. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of God for the people of God. 
us pray. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you so much for the gift of this, your preaching moments. Use me for your glory and let this word go forth with convicting power and the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm lifting up for today's topic, lavish love. Lavish love. So to honor Black Futures Month, we gonna talk about a brother named Zephaniah. He's African, Ethiopian, okay? A, a poetic prophet, and he lived during the reign of the righteous King Josiah. Now Josiah is interesting because he became king when he was eight years old. So some of y'all tripping, talking about, I don't know what God is calling me to do. He was eight, he ain't know nothing. He was watching some ancient Israelite Power Rangers and was sitting on the throne. Stop doubting yourself. God can call you at any age. And so during this reign, 640 to 609 BC, there was the worship of false gods prevailing all throughout Jerusalem at the time. And so Zephaniah, who was related to King Josiah, got on board with ending this idolatry. And so Zephaniah means Yahweh has hidden or Yahweh, the Jewish God, has treasured. It's interesting that what we treasure sometimes needs to be hidden. Not everything can be on full display when it's really precious to God. And so Zephaniah, he is with his contemporaries like Jeremiah. You know, we all love Jeremiah. For I know the plans I think towards you, right? Every graduation, that's your scripture. <laughs> but what's so interesting about that text in Jeremiah is that it's actually third person plural. So it's not you singular. It's not I know the plans I have for Minister LaVon. It's I know the plans I have for y'all, yes. right? So the prophets are speaking to groups of people. Yes. So this is a word that is collective for us today. So he's talking to folks who are residing in places like Moab. Who do we know from Moab? David, David. I was thinking of Ruth, yeah. right? Talking about Nineveh, who do we know who had to go to the Ninevites? Jonah, right? We, he talks about the Philistines, who comes to mind with that? Right, so you see how it's all interconnected. It's like, as the Hebrew Bible turns, you know, just so much drama when you really look at how stories are related and how we get lessons out of each one. Zephaniah is a minor prophet in this drama, this saga, if you will. And so he prophesies about calamities. He talks about how God is going to rage against God's people because of this idolatry. But then we get to verse 14. And that's where God says, sing, O daughter of Zion. The first thing that God does in this move is make a claim on God's people. When it comes to loving people, you have to be invested in their well-being. A lot of times we say that we love people, but we just kind of like people. A lot of times we say we love somebody, but we're really just kind of comfortable with somebody. When you love someone, you claim them as your own. So they might not be your biological family, but they will become someone that you put your mind, body, spirit into supporting. Because that's what God did. And so God beckons us and calls us daughter. God says, you are my child. You are the one that I adore. And that is so important for us because a lot of us just want to be claimed. A lot of us have daddy issues, mommy issues. We want someone to call us child. We want someone to embrace us. We want someone to advocate for us. And that's what God does. God claims us and then tells us to do what? To sing. Now, God knew not to give me a singing voice because I'd just be <laughs> all day. But there's an African proverb that says, if you can talk, you can sing. If you can walk, you can dance. And if you can talk about the goodness of God, if you can testify to what God has done to your life, consider that your song. Yes. Giving God glory is a way of singing. Explaining to people that God brought you through and around and out some really, really difficult mountains. That is a way of singing God's praises. Because remember, God is talking to God's daughter. God is talking to God's child. God is talking to the remnant of people who are believers. Not the ones who are off to the side play playing with other idols. 
play playing with little gods, creating their own gods out of their own identities and dislikes and pleasures. God is calling for the remnant. And this is beautiful because if you go back to verse 1 in Zephaniah, God was not pleased with God's people. God was like, y'all going to catch these hands. Worshiping these idols. What are you doing? And so I intentionally read the beautiful part that makes us feel all warm and gooey inside because we need to be reminded that we have to go back to the beginning. We can't take the gooey without the rage. We can't take the feel goods without the not so feel goods. We cannot have love without justice. Justice is essential for love to be made manifest because it faces the reality and the truth of what was happening in a situation. It teaches us that we cannot come to God any old kind of way, that we have to come to God with honesty, that we have to come to God with truth. It's hard to do. It's hard to speak the things that you don't like about yourself. It's hard to identify and name that as being untrustworthy, as being irresponsible with your finances, of being lazy with your academics. It's real difficult to admit that to yourself, but if you can't admit it to God, then who can you admit it to? And so if you want true love, there's gonna have to be a reckoning of what has been er error in your life. But when error is acknowledged, justice can prevail and then true love can manifest. So while the chapter opens with Yahweh's wrath, God offers love and peace to the faithful remnant. And now as we take a deeper dive into love, it's a word that we hear a lot, it's Black Futures Month, right? It's about to be Valentine's Day, for better or for worse, whether you celebrate or not. <laughs> Folk going to be mad that they don't have no Valentine. Folk going to be mad that they got too many Valentines. It's just, <laughs> it's just another day. <laughs> Can't say amen, say ouch. <laughs> it's real easy to get a Valentine. You just swipe right, you know, enough. Praise the Lord. <laughs> just make sure you pray over your thumb before you start swiping. Just be like, God, give me a spirit of discernment. Spirit of swipe left. Because ultimately, we want to draw love into our lives, right? We want to feel seen. We want to feel heard. We want to feel affirmed. When I was in seminary, I met a woman named Sister Taylor, and she said, you know something, Minister LaVon, love has lost its currency. We use that term so frequently that the gravity and the weight of love is lost. We're like, ooh, I love tacos. <laughs> They're delicious. I love pizza. It's amazing. I love Game of Thrones. Well, I don't, but y'all do. I, I didn't make it through the first episode. I went to a season watch party. I had my Beats by Dre on. I was doing work. But like, I love This Is Us. I love tidying up, you know? We say I love, I love, I love so much that we don't even realize that every time we say I love and it doesn't come with sacrifice. Every time I say I love and it doesn't come with justice. Every time I say I love and it doesn't come with accountability that I am removing the currency of the weight and the meaning of love. And so I challenge you to be mindful about how you use that word this week and to catch yourself in the moment. Something that I'm trying to do in my life is stopping to use violent language in everyday vernacular. So, you know, rolling with the punches. No, 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 I'm not rolling with the punches. I'm going with the flow or <laughs> I'm navigating, <laughs> I'm adjusting, right? Be like, oh, it's so good to see you, hit me up. No, don't hit me. <laughs> Text me or call me. Because words have power, death and life is in the power of the tongue. 
And the enemy is the prince of the air. So if he can get you speaking recklessly, then reckless stuff is going to happen in your life. So you're not taking your word selection seriously and you wonder why you're in the situation that you're in. You're wondering why I, I think I want this, but this is happening because what you're saying is not matching what you're thinking. So be mindful of your words this week. When you catch yourself saying, man, I love da 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 if it's not gravity, weighty, sacrificial, justice-oriented in nature, then just say, I like, or I appreciate, or I admire. Tacos are tasty. Pizza is delicious. Game of Thrones is cool. But I love God. I love myself. I love community. I love protest. I love worship. Let's give love its currency back. Amen? Because what God has done is God has injected love in a new way. As human beings, we are so finite in our understanding of God that we have to use anthropomorphic ways of thinking and being just to try to wrap our minds around the bigness, the grandeur of God. And so what I think we need to do is modify love. I think we need to look at love as we have learned it and, and, and been conditioned to accept it as just one version of a really deep like. But if we can translate God's love into a lavish love, when we think about something that's lavish, it's indulgent, right? It's like very rich and delicious. That's the kind of love that we are promised. How do we know that? Because you got your very own serenader in the creator. God said, God will rejoice over you with joyful songs. To me, that is a soulful serenade. Anybody ever had somebody you like or love sing to you? How, how'd you feel? <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> Why, thank you. Imagine God singing over you. When you are crying late in the midnight hour and you don't think anybody can understand what you're going through. When you are wondering, God, how am I going to make it through this thing right here? Imagine God singing over you. And not just singing any old kind of song. God not out here talking about, yeah, trap this, I'm out here in these streets. God is singing a joyful song over you. God is singing with joy over you. Think about that. God is singing with joy over me. With all of my failings, with all of my shortcomings, with all of my poor decision making, God is singing with joy over me. And if God is singing with joy over you, why aren't you singing with joy over yourself? We have to remember that joy is steady. Happiness fluctuates. Happiness says, I just got paid. I'm good. Joy says, all my bills are paid. I got two nickels. I ate today. We good. <laughs> Happiness is, oh, everybody told me how good I preached today. I'm out here. Joy is, God, you did what I, I did what you called me to do. And whether or not I get claps or pats on the back, I did what I was supposed to do. Joy is steady. Happiness is shaky. So you got to get into some joy, particularly in this day and age, when the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy your joy. When black boy joy is a thing to be stolen, when black girl magic is a thing to be tainted, you have to do the work to hold on to your joy. You gotta curate that timeline a little bit. Social media is not a bad thing if you're following the right people. If folks are not encouraging you to be your highest self, unfollow them. It's real simple. Because we wanna cultivate a lavish love. Lavish means sumptuously rich, elaborate, or luxurious. Yeah, that sounds real good, right? 
It's like a bubble bath. <laughs> Which should not be a luxury. Self-care is not a luxury. Self-care is an obligation. Yeah. And self-care looks like different things for different people. But whatever it is for you, you need to prioritize that thing. Put it in your planner. Put it in your calendar. Just like you put your classes and your meetings with your boss. Put Froyo, nails, walk like Mary, whatever it is, right? It's so key for us. And here's where God really messed me up because lavish as an adjective is sumptuous and rich, delectable. But lavish is also a verb. Lavish is also an action word. It means to bestow something in generous or extravagant quantities on. So when I think about a lavish love, I think about God loving me beyond my faults, beyond my shortcomings in spite of myself. But when I think about lavish love, the action word, now I'm being called into a transformative role. Now I'm being the one who has to lavish love on others. Because once you experience the love of God, if you don't share it with anybody else, what's the point? And a lot of us have been taught that loving people is getting them to look, sound, be like us. So we think loving people means repeating this scripture that I have learned to be true about your sexual identity or how you decide that you want to show up in the world as God's creation. And that I am loving you. What is it? Love the sinner, hate the sin. That irritates me to no end. What we've been taught is love is actually abuse. We have been taught to shame people out of being who they are. We have been taught that you are supposed to forgive and forget for whose benefit? For the systems, for the empires, for the abusive pastors? Who's being protected by your silence? Because that's not real love. Real love calls us to speak our truth. The word says you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. We have to be made free through our truth. And that comes through being a part of a space where you can speak your truth to power. We can grieve Jussie Smollett's attack, but if we still don't fight for basic human rights for our queer brothers and sisters, what's the point? We can grieve four middle school girls being strip searched But if you silence the children who are being sexually abused in your congregation, what's the point? We got to be systematic in this thing, y'all. Lavish love does not have time for us to be pity padding with evil. Lavish love does not have time for us to be two-stepping across complacency. Lavish love is calling us to a new dimension in giving and sacrifice. Not to the point of your detriment, but to the point that God is glorified in your ministry. So as we desire to lavish love on each other, it makes me think of how I am called to be in relationship with people. And it makes me think of homecoming. Now, I did not go to an HBCU. They still love me. I am <laughs> very sad about that, but it's okay. I watch Drumline and I feel better. <laughs> School days, different world. A different world was woke before woke was woke. Different world is it's good stuff. But um, no, I had spoken to Mr. Lauren last year because uh, I made her promise to take me to Hampton Homecoming sometime because it's like a big family reunion, you know? And this is the place where you lived and learned and loved for four or more years. And it feeds you even after beyond your graduation date. 
And when God is talking about us in Zephaniah, God is saying, I will gather you all together again. I will bring you home. Pastor Mike was already in the message when he was talking about the significance of us gathering together to gain strength from each other, to gain wisdom from each other. And so you are here for a very particular reason, a very particular time and purpose. God pulled you out of eternity and set you in this time and space to be a critical element of co-creating a world in this day and age. And the beauty of homecoming is that it had to have been home at some point. So if there's ever a point in your life where you feel like you are too far from God, know that it's not a place that you've never been to. With God, your return is always a homecoming. You cannot return to a place you have never been to. God sets you out into the world, and God will always bring you back to God's self. So just because you don't feel like the apple of God's eye, know that you are the apple of God's eye. Know that with all the aggressions, because there's no such thing as a microaggression. Know that with all of the racism, all of the white supremacy, all of the misogyny, all of the misogynoir, all of the homophobia, all of the transphobia, that you are still at home in God. Do not let the world make you forget whose you are. Because the way, he says she wants us to shout. I want you to know that God loves you lavishly. That's what I want you to know. And that we are called to love lavishly as a result. And so we have to be mindful that the way we see other people says more about us than them. Right? So if at any point in time I'm looking at someone, I'm like, you don't really feel right to me. I got to check myself and be like, Am I seeing something in them that I'm afraid to see in myself? Am I projecting my stuff onto them? Am I superimposing my current issue onto them? Now, sometimes it's just them. Let's be clear, you know. (laughs) Sometimes folks just messy. But your first inclination should be let me check myself, right? Because what I'm finding with God's lavish love is that Even in my worst case, I still need to remember that there is no such thing as hopeless love. If you are hopeless, it is not love. If you are feeling despair, guilt, shame, something is happening that is disconnected with the spirit. Because God says, even when you're off, I still love you. So what is stopping you from receiving God's love? Who told you you weren't good enough to receive God's love? What makes you feel like you don't deserve to be in the presence of God? That's the thing that we need to pinpoint. That's the thing that we need to pull out at the root. Because we love ourselves the way people trained us to love. So we need to deconstruct this idea of love and build ourselves up with God's lavish love. And that starts with ourselves being honest with who we are. That starts with our relationships with others, telling them the truth instead of what we think they want to hear. Because when we tell people what we think they want to hear, That's really us trying to protect our ego. That's really us trying to save face and take the path of least resistance. But when you just say, hey, with compassion, (laughs) this is the truth, capital T, that has to be honored, as difficult as it might be to hear. And so as we decide to rejoice over each other, with singing, as we decide to sing over each other with love songs, I want us to start with the basics. Love your body. God created you with the frame, the complexion, the hair type that you have for a reason. Love it. When you get out the shower, don't just run out the house and be ashy. (laughs) 
Get some coconut oil, get some shea butter, massage it into your skin, say, I love you elbow, I love you knee, I love you foot, I'm serious. Lavish love requires time. Lavish love requires intentionality. Yeah. Eating while you're watching TV. How are you not enjoying the scent, the fragrance, the flavor of the food? Eating is a sensual experience. We're so busy multitasking that we're not doing anything well. So love yourself well. Because when you love yourself well, you can love others well. Like lavish love well. Not love, love well. Amen? Amen? So that's what I want us to do, especially for my sisters, because if tomorrow women woke up and decided that they loved their bodies, do you know how many businesses would go out of? The beauty industry is a $445 billion industry. And they are on track to be an $800 billion industry by 2023. So why do you think they want you to think that you gotta straighten your hair, that you gotta lighten your skin, that you gotta put on fake lashes, nails, and everything else in order to be attractive? Why do you think everybody and their mama who's not a black woman can be a black woman, but we get grief for being black women? <laughs> Love yourself. Maya Angelou said, love recognizes no barriers. It jumps hurdles, leaps fences, penetrates walls to arrive at its destination full of hope. Love is inherently hopeful. Love, lavish love, gets you to your destination full of hope. And as I think about traveling, you know, when I was in seminary, I was always looking for a good deal, because, you know, I'm in seminary, praise the Lord. Any grad students, you know. Hey, what's the lecture on? I don't know. They got food. I'm going to be there. <laughs> that life. <laughs> Are you about that life? Um, and so I was looking to go to a conference in Chicago, and I was looking at flight prices. And you know who consistently had the cheapest airfare? Spirit Airlines. <laughs> Y'all already know, spirit is of the devil. Spirit don't got no spirit. None. You be like, ooh, this spirit is $19. They be like, $30 for a carry-on. Excuse me? <laughs> so here's the thing. Spirit Airlines attracts you with the airfare. But then they give you the okie doke with all the charges. But how often do we fool people into a lulling love and then hit them with the okie doke? How often does our love have fine print attached to it? Yeah. Folks say, oh, I love you. But your misogyny says, I can't stand you. <laughs> Folks say, I love you, but your anti-blackness alerts me to foul play. People will fix their mouths to say, I love you, but their homophobia reeks of oppression. Does your love come with fine print? Is your love conditional? Because the ulterior motives and hidden charges of fraudulent love are homicidal. For far too long, we have been the cause of supernatural pain and spiritual death. Lavish love does not gossip. Lavish love is not two-faced. Lavish love is not phony. No longer will we be the catalyst for destruction. We must be the conduit for creation. Yeah. Lavish love 
rescues us, delivers us, heals us, liberates us, transforms us, reconciles us, lavish love saves us. One of my preaching professors, Thomas Troger from Yale Divinity School, he wrote a book called Are You Saved? And he says, love is salvation, is realizing that no matter how good we have been, our debt to God is more than pocket change. That God has poured love, acceptance, and forgiveness into us. Lavish love requires us to love God, worship God, Praise God, adore God, honor God, serve God. Lavish love requires you to look in the mirror each and every day and say, I love you. Nobody should say, I love you to you before you say, I love you to you. Lavish love on your neighbor looks like loving the people you like and don't like. Loving the people who think like you and don't think like you. Let's grab love's currency back. How do we do that? By lavishing on God, by lavishing on ourselves, by lavishing on each other. We lavish with protest. We lavish by serving. We lavish by lobbying. We lavish by praying. We lavish by meditating. We lavish by eating right. We lavish when we disrupt the currency. We lavish when we disrupt the status quo. We lavish when we disrupt the economy. We lavish when we trust God to do the unthinkable. We lavish when we trust God to do the impossible. We lavish when we tell systems no more. We lavish when we go to City Hall. We lavish when we go to the polls. We lavish when we lay before God. We lavish when we come to the church house. We lavish when we pray at our house. We lavish when we do what they don't think we can. We lavish when we love our queer brothers. We lavish when we love our trans sisters. We lavish when we say enough is enough of violating God's creation. When we lavish, a lavish love erases doubt. A lavish love creates community. A lavish love brings forth healing and restoration. And so I invite you to a lavish love, to lavish love today and always. Amen. Amen. Amen.